Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's All Space Considered. Um, I'm Dr. David Reitzel, and as you can see, I have our social media information up on the screen for you there. You can contact us there if you need to or would like to. And tonight, as always, is the first Friday of the month where we have All Space Considered. But tonight, of course, it is All Space Considered Remote. Um, with me tonight, as always, is Patrick So and Chris Butler, our All Space Considered regulars. <clears throat> We'd like to also mention that All Space Considered is brought to you by Griffith Observatory, which is owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles. And we'd also like to thank the Griffith Observatory Foundation, our nonprofit partner that supplies so much of what we need to bring these shows to you, uh, equipment and support for things like our online school program that we'll be doing this fall for the students throughout Southern California. So we greatly appreciate all the foundation does. And for tonight's show, we've got a great show for you. The first story is White Dwarf Living on the Edge. We have more news from Jupiter and Mars, methane measurements and mysteries, a giant comet, Bernard Dill, ah, gosh, Chris has got a comment about how to say those, those comet names. They're actually people names, but every single time, the combination I have trouble with. Let me try again. Comet Bernardinelli, Bernstein is outgassing. Also, Hubble is back. So we got some good news. Is it completely back? How's it going? We'll have to see. We're going to go out to launch yet again. We do this every month because every month there are so many launches now. The space, everything is just going crazy out in space. It's fantastic. Uh, Patrick has another fascinating sky report. We'll tell you what to go look for this month. There are some cool things. We've got a pretty pictures and some solar system weather report with KD space weather. And we're going to close out tonight's show with an update on our 50th anniversary celebrations. Tonight, we're celebrating Apollo 15, which explored the moon on wheels. It's the first time we actually drove around for exploration. So Chris, I'll tell you about that. And then I'll tell you why it would have been really hard to fake it. So join us, uh, keep your questions in mind about what you think might be going on. Well, I'm gonna open tonight's show I don't think I've forgotten anything tonight. When we were in our theater, we used to have to say all sorts of extra stuff about how to get out of the theater, but I think you all know where to go if you have an emergency at home. Um, and we apologize in advance for any problems we have with the show, any audio issues. We, I always appreciate when people type into the chat if something comes up and we have moderators in there that can help answer questions and it's a fun way to participate with the show with the YouTube chat. So feel free to join in there if you'd like. Our first story tonight comes from the Keck Observatory, one of my favorite observatories on Mauna Kea and a great place to observe from. Well, some astronomers were observing white dwarfs and they discovered one that was a little unusual. Well, first, first of all, a white dwarf is a kind of star, and they're actually on our beautiful uh, red giant diagram here, our, our HR diagram, uh, Hertzsprung Russell, the two astronomers that put this together. It is a color luminosity diagram where color goes from left to right. As you can see, blue is on the left, red is on the right, and brightness goes from the bottom to the top. It turns out that this is also a sequence in temperature, and there are white dwarfs on this plot, believe it or not, there they are, so they're faint. They're near the bottom of the plot, but they're also kind of, well, well, white. They're kind of in the middle part of the, the diagram there where stars are white, and I'll blow them up there. And indeed, they're small too. We've coded these stars to be the right size of what the stars should be. So our own sun is on there. Let me show you where our sun is. Our sun is up in, oh, let me get the pointer. I thought I had it, but I didn't. Our sun is right over here. Um, our sun isn't red, of course, it's, it's kind of a whitish yellow, um, but these white dwarfs are about one tenth the size of our sun or even smaller, you know, earth sized, down to earth size. Sorry, one tenth is Jupiter, one one hundredth the size of our sun is the proper size of a white dwarf. Um, they're not Jupiter sized, they are earth sized. Now, how do they get there to start? Well, stars go through different life phases. So we're going to spend the next 45 minutes going through all the details of stellar evolution. No, that'll come some other time in the future. Tonight we're doing all space considered. So we'll quickly focus on sort of a sun, a star like our sun, something about that massive. Starts as a, as a cloud of glass and dust, ignites with nuclear fusion down on the center, glows for a very long time. We're talking about 10 billion years or so, expands and cools into a red dwarf. The outer layers at least get cooler. Finally, it goes through, goes through a couple other complicated phases, a horizontal branch phase, an asymptotic giant branch phase, but eventually it puffs off its outer layers, making a beautiful planetary nebula, and that little white dot that's left behind in the middle is the core of the star that cools off into the white dwarf. So these are stars that have died. 
It's the leftover remnants of what was a star like the sun. Now, they are, like I said, about the size of the Earth. Now, these folks that were studying it, as you can see the names here, lots of them on the paper. Um, Chiazzo and Burge were the two main authors on this. Uh, Jeremy Heil, I was in graduate school with, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, great guy, by the way, super cool. So Jeremy, if you're out there, hello. Um, anyway, they found a highly magnetized and rapidly rotating white dwarf that was as small as the moon. So as small as the moon, you might initially think, gosh, if it's not as big as the earth, it must be a really, really low mass white dwarf. There must not be much stuff there. Actually, it's the other way around. The more mass you pour into a white dwarf, the more it collapses itself, the more it squeezes itself. So they become denser and denser and denser. Now, there is a stopping point, 1.41 solar masses, the Chandra Sekar limit, an astronomer in the Chandra Sekar calculated this. And sure enough, we don't find any white dwarfs more massive than about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. This one is really massive. It is um, about 1.37, 1.38 solar masses, getting right up there to the edge. It's rotating every about every seven minutes, just under that. It has a very strong magnetic field and its stellar radius is only 1300 miles. So this is a super unusual object. Um, by the way, is that a strong magnetic field? Yes, yes. By the way, an MRI scanning machine only has about um, seven times 10 to the four Gauss. So that's 70,000 Gauss is all. I mean, so we're talking about million, anyway, super, super strong magnetic fields. You get crazy strong. Now, what interests me about this white dwarf, not just that it's rapidly spinning, not that it's super massive, but it might explode on its own. I know you can think, well, how could something just explode? Does it just sit there, get tired of being there and blow up? Well, no, previously we knew there were a couple of ways white dwarfs could blow up. You could have two spiraling around one another and finally they merge, too much mass there, boom, it explodes. Or you can have a neighboring star. This was actually the first idea we had that grows, evolves, turns into a red giant. And as it does so dumps material onto the other star. It sort of goes past the tipping point, flows over onto it add too much mass, boom, you explode as a supernova, a type 1a. Well, this white dwarf might do it just on its own. I know that sounds crazy, but currently there are, if this is a young white dwarf, and the fact it's spinning fast and has a strong magnetic field is a sign that it's probably young. They tend to slow down over time. The magnetic field does what's called magnetic breaking. It'll slow that white dwarf down. It won't be spinning so fast, so it's probably pretty young. If it's young, there's probably a bunch of stray protons that have yet to merge with electrons and crystallize into neutrons. If there are enough of them there, a neutron weighs more than a proton and electron on their own. If you add the two together, you have more mass than you started with. I know it sounds crazy, but this is how the universe works. So it could grow in mass as it crystallizes. And if it grows past that 1.4 solar masses, it'll explode. Now, will we see anything? I don't know. That's why there's a big question mark there. And it probably won't happen in our lifetime. I'm sorry to say this is something that may happen in <laughs> millions of years. Uh, you know, it's going to be a slow process. But I don't know if you'd even see anything because there's not a lot of material to interact with. It just goes from white dwarf suddenly down to a neutron star. You don't have a neighboring star. You don't have any material that was flung off as the two merge together. Um, I don't know. I didn't have time to find any simulations on it. But it's certainly... Um, would cause a lot of energy locally there, and it would be very, very interesting. So um, now on to something that seems a little mundane to most people, but actually there are some high energy particles causing some interesting things at Jupiter. And Patrick's here to tell us all about it. All right, so uh, let's uh, go to Jupiter, our uh, solar system's largest uh, uh, gaseous planet. And uh, so, um, it's been a 40 year old mystery about what causes Jupiter's X-ray aurora. And uh, that has just been solved. Here we see um, an image, uh, the purple here represents the um, X-ray emissions from Jupiter's aurora as detected by the Chandra Space Telescope in 2007. And it's superimposed um, against the uh, Hubble Space Telescope uh, image that you see there in black and white. Now these X-ray pulses uh, were uh, kind of detected every 27 minutes, uh, kind of animating from the poles of Jupiter. And scientists knew that these aurora had to have uh, be triggered by ions crashing into Jupiter's upper atmosphere at that polar region. But they didn't really know the mechanism of uh, how those ions got there in the first place. So um, what about these ions? Where do they come from? Well, the, the 
there's a lot of ions being spewed out by the volcanoes of Io, and uh, you can see all of that in the orange there. And this is a major source of ions, mostly positively charged uh, sulfur and oxygen uh, atoms, kind of entrapped uh, within uh, Jupiter's intense magnetic field. So what did they do? Well, back in 2017, in an effort to solve the mystery, uh, two spacecraft were used to make measurements uh, um, of uh, Jupiter's uh, X-ray emissions over 26 hours. Uh, on the left there, you see the XMM Newton, which is, uh, which is used to detect the uh, X-rays coming from uh, Jupiter. Uh, that's run by the European Space Agency. And that right is uh, NASA's Juno spacecraft, which is currently in orbit around uh, Jupiter. And that was used to take readings uh, from uh, within the uh, inside of the, uh, the, the magnetic fields inside of uh, Jupiter. Um, so what they found was that the, that pulse, the pulsating X-ray auroras uh, are caused by fluctuations in Jupiter's magnetic fields. And as the planet rotates, uh, uh, the magnetic field kind of uh, gets dragged around by the Jupiter's ra uh, rapid rotation. Um, also, um, another factor is that uh, when the magnetic field is compressed by the solar wind, uh, uh, these changes can be detected by Juno, and they were uh, when Juno was getting close to a flyby of uh, Jupiter, millions of miles away from the planet. So um, there was a compression of uh, solar wind ag against the magnetic field, and uh, this uh, compression uh, heats up the ions and, uh, and triggers uh, what is known as an electromagnetic ion synchrotron wave. And so that's a big word, but uh, basically it's just a electromagnetic pulse. And just imagine the particles uh, riding along a, a like a tidal wave, uh, but electromagnetic in that sense, along the magnetic field lines. And uh, so these uh, ions actually moved. Uh, initially, they kind of stay there trapped in uh, Jupiter's magnetic field and they don't do anything. But now they're set in motion uh, by a change in the magnetic field, and there's a force applied on these uh, particles. So what happens? Well, the particles move along the magnetic field uh, towards the polar regions, and here they are. And you get, uh, should you get another solar uh, wind compression, you get another um, surge of particles along the magnetic field lines. And in the red uh, circle there, uh, the, you can see that uh, a bunch of particles about to uh, interact with the magnetic field. And once it does, uh, you get a burst of X-rays and that pulse of X-rays generated from the South Pole there is detected by the XMM Newton spacecraft out in Earth's orbit just a few minutes later. So um, that's the kind of uh, mechanism that's happening there. Here we see uh, a similar thing happening in the Northern hemisphere, the Northern polar region. So Jupiter's aurora process is quite different from the Earth's, uh, where you know normally uh, when the sun is very active, we get a, a coronal mass injection, a bunch of charged particles um, uh, interact with the Earth's magnetic field. They go down the field lines and then towards the poles, and then collide with the Earth's upper atmosphere, where we get these brilliant uh, northern and southern lights uh, that we normally see in the invisible light. But at Jupiter, um, it's the ions from the, uh, from the moons of Jupiter, uh, mostly uh, Io and some other moons, uh, where the, um, within the magnetic field that crash into, the, into Jupiter's atmosphere and trigger a compression, which is triggered by a compression of the magnetic field by the, magnetic, uh, by the solar wind. So that's a very different uh, mechanism. And uh, it's something that scientists are excited about because this could happen, say, on, uh, on other uh, uh, gas giant planets like Saturn with um, its moon Enceladus that um, has ions of, of hydrogen coming off from the water. So very interesting uh, mechanism and uh, done in collaboration with two spacecraft, which uh, confirmed uh, how this uh, happened. Another discovery um, is... Uh, a brand new moon of Jupiter has been discovered by amateur astronomer uh, by the name of Kai Lee. Uh, and if it becomes official, um, the number total moon count uh, goes from 79 to 80 moons 
of uh, Jupiter. Now, the, this moon is uh, orbits in a region where we see the orange uh, red uh, orbit lines there. Um, it was discovered um, in infrared images taken in 2003 by Canadian Canada France Hawaii telescope. Um, that's uh, the data was actually available uh, to the public on the web. And um, this uh, moon is uh, believed to be a member of the Kami uh, group uh, that orbits uh, in the opposite direction or retrograde to uh, Jupiter's rotation. So um, the moon in this region, uh, the, the moon Kani is the largest one in that group. And it's about 46 uh, kilometers um, in diameter. Now, just to, uh, as we look at this diagram, look, look, all those orbits look very close. And that's because this uh, diagram is not uh, to scale. Um, the orbits of those, uh, of the Carnet group in this orange, all those orange lines there uh, are actually uh, not to scale. And even the banana is not to scale, um, but they're actually uh, about 22 million uh, kilometers uh, from Jupiter. And so that would be way out of this uh, image there. But we've kind of uh, thrown everything together to give you a sense of the uh, direction of orbit. Um, so how are these moons discovered? Well, the moon Carne was discovered uh, uh, by this, um, by, Wise, uh, by the Wise spacecraft in 2014. And uh, it took a series of images, uh, basically, uh, I'm going to run this again here, go back. And you can see these individual images. You just barely see the moon. But uh, what they did was they put all those images together and combined them. Um, um, so you can see all the images stacked and to visibly show the uh, actual uh, moon um, in the center here. So in a similar fashion, um, the amateur astronomer uh, went on the web, uh, looked at the um, data from the Canadian France, Hawaii France telescope and, uh, and found a little smudge there. You can see it, it's within the ellipse and there's a little arrow there and pointing to a smudge. Um, and I'm just gonna step through just uh, three images here. This is the first one. And the next one, you can see the smudge has moved and the background stars has. So exciting discovery there. All right. so. Talking about discoveries, uh, Jupiter is uh, being orbited by the Juno spacecraft, uh, which uh, continues to uh, reveal some of the secrets of Jupiter. The Juno spacecraft uh, made its 35th close pass of Jupiter. It's called, um, the close pass is, uh, is called Perijove, and it's Perijove 35, and it gets as close as, at, uh, as 26 um, 2,600 miles, uh, but this time it got even closer, uh, a mere 2,000 miles above the uh, cloud tops of uh, Jupiter um, on the uh, 21st. Also, uh, something interesting here, uh, you saw that beautiful um, flyby of Ganymede and uh, Jupiter at the beginning of uh, this program. Um, that flyby of Jupiter uh, changed the orbit of, uh, of uh, Juno it had a 53 day old orbit around Jupiter and now it is uh, changed to 43 days. Um, so uh, I'll be reporting uh, 10 days sooner than uh, for the next perijove. So what do we see from this perijove? Well, again, uh, uh, Juno continues to uh, really excite us with and us and the public and the scientists with these incredible, beautiful pictures. Um, here we see the um, northern uh, polar region, a region that you can't see from Earth uh, because it's kind of hidden. Um, this is centered on uh, latitude 75 degrees and the north polar region is at the bottom there, right there with the uh, laser pointer, uh, right there, that's the pole of, uh, of Jupiter. Now, um, this picture was taken at, uh, this is one of the closest pictures taken of Jupiter's cloud tops, uh, 2,000, and 52 miles where you can see incredible detail. Um, just bear in mind, this isn't the entire disk of Jupiter. This is a fisheye view. So where you see the edges there, that's the edge of the camera, uh, the horizon that the camera can see from that vantage point. Um, a little bit uh, further away, about 400 miles higher than the previous picture, 
um, incredible detail, intricate details of, of the, these swirling clouds of Jupiter. And those uh, white uh, cumulus-like clouds are actually ammonia ice crystals, a pop-up uh, kind of thunderstorm clouds. And again, uh, beautiful uh, swirly um, uh, brown spots and, and also other storms are visible here. And you get a sense, looking at these images, you can actually see some of the uh, uh, shaded kind of relief of these clouds uh, just by looking at the shadows of those uh, cumulus clouds there. Um, you can actually almost see a three dimensional reality of uh, these images. And our last picture, um, this is uh, one of many uh, that, were public, uh, that were processed by the public, is a, a view of what on the left uh, Jupiter would look like to our eyes if you were in the, in the vantage point of Juno. Uh, kind of um, not quite bland, but there is some detail there. And then on the right, um, a color enhanced uh, image to show this exquisite detail uh, of fluid dynamics happening in Jupiter's atmosphere. And that's uh, it for the Jupiter report. Well, thank you, Patrick. Um, always interesting to see these beautiful images coming from Jupiter and the, the work that people do on it to bring out these details can be done by all of you out there as well. Patrick has created tutorials on these that you can find on our webpage that tells you about how to download the images, how to convert them, how to load them, sharpen them, color them, go have fun. It's part of what these missions are all about, engaging the public with the astronomy. And it, it's just, it's it's brilliant. It's a, it's a good time and, and we've told you how to do it. Now, what's also a really great time, um, well, some of the questions we've been getting are great. I wanna answer one very quickly. Someone wanted to know, what could we be finding out about Jupiter that could be applied to exoplanets out there? Well, we have a lot of Jovian sized exoplanets and larger, and Juno has been studying the internal makeup of Jupiter. We've learned some details about it, and we've also learned about <clears throat> sort of the conveyor belts of energy that are going on between Jupiter, its ionosphere, um, the auroras Patrick was just talking about. Someday we will have telescopes that will be able to see if those are happening on other exoplanets and pick these things up. So pretty much everything Juno is learning about Jupiter can be applied to Jovian-sized exoplanets. It's a really exciting time. Now, it's also an exciting time out at Mars. The Perseverance rover has been doing some really great work, has gotten, gotten down to doing the science. If it, of course, landed on Mars, right there where the word perseverance is, well, where the dot is, at an interesting location. You can see here, it landed in a delta sort of an area. Um, we think it was an old, uh, well, a crater that was filled in with a lake. Water flowed in from one side, flowed out the other side. So there was great hope there's sedimentary rocks here that might show signs of life left over. It landed at that Octavia E. Butler landing site. And please Google Octavia E. Butler and go have some fun. Um, some great reading is, is in store for you if you do. Well, the rover right now has moved on over to this location here um, and has been looking at things, whereas the helicopter is also over on that side. And I'll tell you in a little bit how Ingenuity got there. And you can see the plan is to drive over a little bit further and then to return back towards the landing site and head towards Three Forks eventually. So that's sort of the planned route we're going to take. Again, beautiful views from there. These sorts of rocks we haven't really seen quite like these. They're kind of gray in color. They're covered by that you know pinkish dust that's everywhere on Mars. But you see these rocks that look a little bit more like river rocks you might see up in the Sierras and some of the rivers. Um, they're tilted kind of similar directions too when you look at them. I don't know if that has to do with flow or I doubt it's wind erosion, but maybe. But then the ones that are interesting are those flat rocks down in front. They're different than most of those other rocks you're seeing there. Those we're calling paving stones because they seem to literally pave sort of the flat area underneath all these other rocks that are laying around. So we wanted to know, what are they? And this is a close up view of it here. You take a look at it, but it's covered by that pink dust. You have to clean that off and use the abrasion tool, which brings us to our next segment here. Is it Mars or is it Earth? We have two images here. One of them is Mars, one of them is Earth. And can you tell which is which? All right, get your votes in now. A million dollars on the line. Okay, not really, there's, there's no money on the line at all. When we move forward here, we take a look. The abrasion tool indeed was used, here it is. When you look at the sort of rock surface itself, it's very you know chunky and, and whatever, but you clean it off and it's, it's quite smooth down in there. 
um, going forward, we zoom and enhance. And indeed, that's the one it is. And the left was a granite countertop. And on the right hand side was a plain old Mars rock that they used the abrasion tool on. Now, what is that rock made of? We don't know. It looks similar to a granite. It kind of doesn't look very sedimentary to me. I'm not a geologist, though, so we're going to wait and see what Watson and Sherlock have to say about it. Um, no, I, I am reading some Conan O'Dell, O'Dell books right now, uh, and I'm reading some Sherlock Holmes, but not, not the inspector, it's actually the instrument. And uh, they're going to get down there and see whether it's worthwhile to take a sample. And this is the sampling mechanism they're hope to use on this site, on this rock. They're going to get a core sample. Well, they're thinking about it. And that core sample is kind of similar to a size of chalk, if any of you remember what chalk is like. Um, hopefully kids are still doing chalk out on the street, although the ones I've seen on the street are really big and fat, so it's the narrow, thin chalks. Um, anyway, they've, they've already gone in. Um, this is kind of the machinery that's going to be used for the sample taking and everything that's going on, just to show you that it's all really there. It looks very science labby and serious. One thing they have to do, though, is sample the atmosphere. If you don't know what's in the air, and then you get a sample of rock and the air contaminates the rock, you might think something's in the rock that actually was just in the air. So they've opened up what they're calling a witness tube. And that witness tube witnesses the air that's available. So they open it up, sample the air, they clean it out, they do all their stuff they need to do, seal it back up. And then that is there to tell the scientists what was in the air when we got this sample. Now, they have gone ahead and made a little bit of a drill there. You can see the tailings. So they're preparing to take a sample, it looks like. They are going to use Watson and Sherlock, a couple of instruments. They'll use the other instruments. You don't have to get the sample right away. And they'll determine, is this worthwhile? They're hoping to sort of get a baseline. What are all these paving stones like? Because their material might be found all over the place. So they, they're, they're approaching this scientifically. We don't expect to see signs of life in this sample, however. This is definitely the initial work to do it correctly, do it right, so we really understand what's going on. Now, the samples we're talking about taking, they're not even going to get back here until the early 2030s. It, it's highly unlikely that in the 2026 sample return mission, it's not funded. It doesn't. We don't know how it's getting there, so they told us probably early 2030. Now, what Chris is going to show you and talk about, maybe there's some other folks here on Earth that might get to Mars. <laughs> we'll see about that. There is another target off in the distance. This is the SuperCam RMI images of it. And you can see sort of the layered material here. This stuff might be interesting. That might be more sedimentary. When you have layers like that, you think that's sort of a like a lake bed that's been laid down over time as the sediment falls down. Well, dead little critters fall down in there, get cemented in. Maybe there's some signs of life in there, little evidence of microbes, but we'll have to see. That's off in the future. Another interesting thing Chris Burns has been doing has been doing some automatic driving, automated driving. That's right. It doesn't have to be steered quite as slowly like Curiosity. Now, Curiosity wasn't steered live. They would take images, they plan it out, and they make a very small move, and it had some very finite automated capabilities. Perseverance is like upgraded. It knows where it goes. It takes some very cool uh, images, processing as it goes, and they can kind of set it free. Now, you notice the uploaded drive programs, driving it the old way was in the blue rectangle. The new way that they just tested is in that green one, and you can see how much faster they're able to go. It is a lot faster, a lot more economical, and as long as Percy doesn't decide to go drive around in the dunes and have some fun on her own, um, we'll be okay. Now, they, they doubt it will do that. They've really programmed it to avoid things that will get stuck in. They don't want to get stuck in the dunes. Um, by the way, the top speed now has been up to about 152 meters per hour. That's uh, 4.2 centimeters per second. So, you know, watch out. It's it's actually fairly fairly quick for a rover on a on a on a foreign on a, on a different planet. That's pretty great. Uh, we don't need to be going much faster than that. It is time for our update on Ingenuity, um, the helicopter that was brought along with Perseverance. Um, it had its first eight flights in green. The ninth flight path was with that one you see there. That's extra dangerous because you're flying over all those dunes. The dunes go up and down and up and down. So imaging the terrain becomes difficult. Knowing where you're going is difficult. It sort of squishes the image as you look at one slope because they can't pan the camera around. It's just staring down. They weren't really sure Ingenuity would know quite how high it was, where it was going. They did their best to program it and everything went great. It took off, here's some stills from the flight. You can see the shadow 
down below of the helicopter. It's staring straight down, getting higher and higher into the air. We're talking, you know, 30, 40 feet in the air at this point. We're not messing around. This helicopter is actually getting high into the air. It is flying longer distances than it's flown before. This one had a horizontal distance of 625 meters. So that's, you know, six so soccer fields long. I mean, we're these distances are getting really pretty impressive that this little helicopter is flying. And you can see the scouting is pretty neat. You're looking down there at rocks. We're seeing sand dunes. You can evaluate terrain and it gives you an unusual perspective that Perseverance can't get sitting on the ground looking forward. So this little test vehicle, remember, this was just a prototype to see, will it work at all, is looking like it's going to pay off and be exceptionally useful for future um, future exploration as long as it can keep up with the rover. Um, speaking of which, it had a 10th flight as well as the 9th flight that was very complicated. There were 10 waypoints along the way that the computer had to see, analyze, recognize, and then continue on its way. It successfully did all of that as well. So a 10th flight in the books that was great. You can see some information about the flights here and the horizontal distances that have been going up, you know, 2,051 feet. That's not quite half a mile, but it's a third of a mile. It's more than a third of a mile on that longest flight. So pretty crazy uh, flights from the helicopter. It made it an 11th flight too, but very short. Just did a little hop, relocated to a new sort of airport for it, so to speak. Lastly, from Mars, I know it's been a long Mars report, but we didn't talk Mars last month. Um, the InSight lander has still been making measurements. Remember, this is the one that has the seismograph on Mars. It's capturing those pictures of clouds going by from the surface of Mars, a lot of fun, but it's also making measurements of Mars quakes. You can see here, the ground shakes, it picks it up just like our seismograph at Griffith Observatory, and you can use Mars quakes to measure the internal structure of a planet. The earthquake happens, it bounces off the different layers inside, comes on up and is received by ingenuity. Depending on how those reflections are measured, how they arrive, it tells you about the structure. And there were three basic ideas we had, three possible interstructures for Mars, sulfur rich, molten iron nickel core, and no plate tectonics. In other words, it's pretty locked up on the top. Or the second choice, sulfur core, not a lot of sulfur, inner and outer iron nickel core, and it's just not sufficient to drive those plate tectonics. So again, there is an outer core that's moving, but it's not making the plate tectonics. And then lastly, two layered core like Earth's, and indeed there's some plate tectonics going on. Now we don't see signs of that on the surface. We see volcanoes, we don't see a lot of motion. So we didn't think the third one necessarily, but maybe. Well, or <laughs> Insight rather, has shown that it's most likely the top one that the core is probably sulfur rich, that it's molten iron nickel, and that there are no plate tectonics, just like we see. So this is our probable model for uh, Mars at this time. You can see the, the radius, 3390 kilometers, the mantle is quite thick, the crust, not all that thick, 24 to 72 kilometers, fairly thin, but it's not convecting, it's not moving, so it's locked in place. This leads to things like huge volcanoes, like Olympus Mons on Mars. So very, very interesting. Um, there still might have been life on ancient times on Mars, but it's a lot harder to do if you don't have something like plate tectonics to drive and recycle the atmosphere. And also, um, it might give you more volcanoes that might help you produce more atmosphere at the plate boundaries where they interact. So different story. We need to learn how Mars evolved. But we do know that here on Earth, there's been a lot of evolution and a lot of life. And Jeff McKibben is here to tell us about some ancient life and some interesting implications this might have. Jeff, what do you got for us? That's right. Uh, all of these rovers and landers are doing really great, important work on Mars and discovering Mars's part in the history of life in our solar system, if it indeed had one. But there's discoveries on Earth as that also further that goal. Uh, in July, a paper was published about fossil microbes trapped in ancient deep sea rock uh, from an environment that might have looked something like these modern deep sea vents here. These fossils were discovered in South Africa, just north of the border of Eswatini. Uh, this area is currently above ground or above the water level, but way back in the day when these fossils were formed, this was deep underwater. And here they are. If you're not sure what you're looking at, don't worry, you're not alone. I wasn't sure either at first. What you're looking for are those little black lines. This is a kind of rock called chert, where it's basically quartz with crystals that are so small you can't see them. 
And these little black lines aren't necessarily supposed to be there. They could have been some kind of mineral intrusion. So scientists did a chemical analysis and found that they're actually organic compounds. They're carrigens, which is a fancy way of saying they are the decayed organic remains of once living material. You're probably familiar with some other carrigens like crude oil, which is a big one. But these are a bit smaller than the oil deposits you're used to seeing. Uh, they're only about this big. Even at the size of a penny, the microscope view is too large. You have to zoom in to about 50, uh, I keep on forgetting, that's micrometers, right? Yeah, that's micron. Yeah. That's microns. Uh, that little, that little uh, 50 micron, that's also about the length of a human hair, depending on who you are. So this is a very small thing. Now, its size isn't what's impressive. They're microbes. We expect them to be really small. What's special about them is that they are very old. So we talk about old in terms of the history of the entire planet, from the Earth forming to all space considered August 2021, probably the two most important dates in the history of the Earth. Uh, if you look at when humans first evolved to our sort of modern anatomical state, that happened pretty recently. These microbes are older than that. If you look at when the first animals developed, well, these microbes are older than that. They're older even than the first land plants. These microbes developed about three and a half billion years ago. Uh, and that's really good. The thing is, these aren't the only fossils. This isn't the only evidence of life that has been found from around this period. But the thing is, other fossils are something called stromatolites. And these things are kind of like us. They take in oxygen and use carbon dioxide or produce carbon dioxide. And this process, this oxygen cycle is used to sort of make energy, this metabolism. Plants, I mean, plants and stromatolites also took in sunlight to, you know, generate their own oxygen. It's, it's a very efficient thing. It's very cool. But these fossils that we're talking about now, they didn't do that. In fact, they used, instead of oxygen or CO2, they used methane. So unlike uh, animal life that I'm used to seeing on our planet, like plants and fungi and animals, these things either produced or consumed methane to do that. And while we're while we can expect very diverse metabolisms nowadays, like three and a half billion years after life began, seeing that kind of diversity among the earliest life is really amazing. And it has implications in, for the search for life in other parts of our solar system, like Mars. Three and a half billion years ago, it seems like Mars also had conditions ripe for life. And if life on Earth not only started, but existed in incredible diversity very soon after it started, that makes you a little bit more hopeful that life might be more common than we once thought. Now, this is, this is a, a piece of evidence to add on uh, to, the, to the growing, uh, growing body of research about this kind of thing. But there's one other thing, and that is that it used methane. And that's a big deal because that also expands the kinds of places where we should reasonably think to look for life. For example, Titan, I think it's one of Saturn's moons that has liquid oceans of methane. And while we're probably not gonna find anything like this critter here, we might, might find more microbes. This is a really cool thing because, well, if life can survive in more diverse places than we once thought, every discovery we make seems to suggest more and more and more that life from a very early point uh, developed rapidly, well, developed rapidly in multiple directions. That says very promising things as far as the search for life on other, uh, on other worlds goes, at least I think so. I think so too, Jeff. That's a very interesting report about these microbes that are actually um, they're eating the methane because oftentimes we think about methanogens that consume methane, but these are sort of, or, or produce methane rather. Yeah. Uh, we have cows that produce methane. Um, yeah. All so, about methane production. So, but these, these actually would live off the methane there. So a, a location that had methane maybe could have this life form. It seems likely the researchers weren't able to 100% rule out if they were producing or consuming the methane um, just because the the cells had completely degraded. The only trace was that uh, they found higher concentrations of nickel than was expected. And that is something that is used in both methane producing and methane consuming microbes. 
Okay, well, very interesting, more work to do there. Yeah. Now, I know another location where we've detected some methane, we've seen some, is Enceladus. And um, we have a report going on from there as well. This is all part of our methane information. Uh, take it away. <laughs> oh, thanks, uh, Dr. Reitzel. Uh, yeah, we do have something interesting on this. We've talked about methane possibly being important for looking for signs of life in the universe, and we've had a sniff of it in an interesting place. Uh, the small moon Enceladus, which orbits Saturn, is a bright, icy moon. Uh, the image you see there is from uh, the Voyager spacecraft in 1981. We knew that the surface wasn't just cratered solid ice because parts of the moon, its surface had uh, been reworked. The craters had been erased. So we knew there were some dynamics inside this object, but the Cassini spacecraft, when it got out and had a look at Enceladus, uh, found some truly remarkable things here. It turns out that this moon is actually venting water vapor uh, into space, becoming uh, water crystals and blowing out from cracks and crevices in the crust of this moon. This demonstrated pretty clearly that there is a water ocean underneath that ice. Now, it's very cold out here. You wouldn't think that you could have water this far from the sun, but the idea is that uh, tidal stresses could cause heating inside this moon from Saturn and also from other moons that pass it. This uh, kneading of the cosmic dough produces friction and a layer of the ice at the bottom would have melted and created an ocean. There would probably be volcanism as well on the, the rocky inner core of the moon. Now, that kind of environment under an ocean, uh, volcanism, all the rest of that, if the ingredients were right, well, that would look a lot like what we thought life on Earth might have been developing in, in the primordial times. Well, they uh, naturally would like to get a look at those plumes because it's a sample of that ocean. This is something that came up from the inside. And can we get at it? Yes, we can. The Cassini spacecraft, specifically was directed to fly through some of those plumes and to take samples using its instruments uh, to uh, determine the composition of it. And yes, they found methane. Uh, in fact, more analysis recently looking at the original Cassini data has suggested there was more methane than they were originally expecting to be there, more than the geology seemed to suggest. This is the uh, chemical reaction that we would be used by a methanogen bacteria on Earth. The critical thing is on the leading edge, you've got carbon dioxide and hydrogen being consumed, and that produces a little bit of water and some methane. Now, the carbon dioxide, that was detected in the plume above Enceladus. The hydrogen was detected in the plume. So was the methane. It looks like the ingredients are there, but what's causing the methane? Is it biological or is it just coming from geology? Well, a new study just published in June uh, by these researchers from the University of uh, uh, Paris, uh, Letters and Science, uh, these guys did a detailed analysis and a mathematical model of what could be going on inside Enceladus, the amount of methane that would be in the water, not just in the plume. They think the composition of the plume is a little bit methane poor compared to what would be in the water. So they use the water numbers they think for that ocean. And the answer is that is actually a very potentially habitable environment. First of all, they did have the startling uh, result that the expected geology, the processes we know going on inside Enceladus should produce methane, it doesn't produce enough. So something else is going on. Now, they also found that what they observed in the plume and what they predict for the ocean would just completely be agreeable with the premise of methanogenic bacteria. If this was the earth and we were looking at it, scientists would have no trouble saying, oh, well, that's probably methanogenic bacteria, but it's not the earth. It's not a world like ours at all. It's very different. So the final point that the researchers made is it really depends how likely you think it is that life could have developed on Enceladus. If you think it's likely, then 
methanogenic life forms would make sense. It'd be a good explanation. But if you don't think that's possible, if it seems really unlikely, there must be something else going on. Maybe Enceladus was born with more methane originally than we predicted it was. Or there's some kind of a process inside Enceladus that makes methane that's not something we've thought of yet. Anyway, we don't know the answer yet, but it's an exciting development. And for the moment, this little moon is continuing to tease us with its ghostly veils. And believe me, we're gonna keep looking. Well, thank you on that. That is just super interesting once again. Now, um, there is another object out there that probably contains a lot of ice and it might contain some methane as well, as Patrick <laughs> likes to call it. Um, our, our audience in the chat was saying they prefer it. your pronunciation, Patrick, that they prefer when they hear <laughs> methane. Um, so uh, we might find some on this comet, but what is going on with yeah. the comet Berna, Bernard Dinelli? Bernard it, it, they always seem to be tongue twisters a little bit. And now it, it, it is a longstanding tradition that comets, the discoverer gets their name attached to the comet, like Halley's Comet. Um, so nothing wrong with the names. It's just, I'm a little clumsy with names, uh, but this comet is unusual. And if I say something like giant comet headed toward the sun or whatever, uh, people will get a panicky, strange idea. It's not like that at all. This is not gonna come anywhere near the earth. In fact, quite a distance away, but there's something about it that's special. It really is a big comet. And now to give you an idea, when I say it's not gonna come near, let me, let me be clear about this. Looking at this diagram, the, when I say that the comet's perihelion or its closest passage to the sun will be at 11 AU, believe me, that's not 11 miles. That's 11 times the Earth's sun distance and it's farther away than Saturn. So it'll be passing through the outer solar system. Now there's some benefits to that though. One of them is that when you're that far from the sun, the sun's gravity pulls you less and you move at a lower velocity through space, meaning this comet's going to be around for years and years and years for us to look at and study. Uh, the closest approach isn't until 2031. Now, you may think a comet being that far away, we're not going to get much information. Well, this is a big comet. It's gonna be providing a lot of signal. Now, we don't know exactly how big this comet is. Now, the comet you see, the little one, that's expected to be a typical comet. So yeah, 10, 15 kilometers across. This new one though, is possibly the largest comet we've ever discovered. This comet would be about 100, maybe even 200 kilometers across. Regular all space viewers will know that is also approximately the size of the state of Delaware. Um, but this monster, uh, we've been looking at it, watching it get closer as a tiny little speck. The question was, as the sun warms it up, when will it begin to vaporize, begin to do the comet thing and start to have what we call a coma, a fuzzy ball around it and so forth, producing uh, gases into space we can study. That'll be great when that happens. Well, guess what? It just happened. People have been watching it very closely. A one meter telescope in South Africa, in Sutherland, South Africa, uh, captured this image and it was spotted just very quickly by uh, astronomers in New Zealand who are watching the images as they were regularly taken. And if you look at the image, you'll see it is fuzzy. So the show is beginning. It's not going to be visible to the unaided eye from Earth. Remember, it's a long way away. In fact, for folks who have telescopes, this will be considerably fainter at its brightest than Pluto is in your backyard telescope. So yeah, you probably are gonna see this one at all, but the scientists will. And they'll be studying this thing for years and years and years. And the exciting fun thing for all of us is that the show is just beginning. So remember, comment Bernardinelli Bernstein. Bernstein, Bernardinelli Bernstein. Bernard it's not so hard when you practice a few times. Exactly. But, yeah, and we're going to get a chance to. Yeah. And um, well, thank you for that report. I can't wait to see whether there's any methane surrounding it at this there time. There will be it's methane. Out, it's outgassing quite far already. It's not yeah. as close as it'll get. So it has to be some volatiles that are coming off. I just don't know what they will be. Um, and by the way, just for your reference, here's the state of Delaware. 
<laughs> so, and um, here's the size of Los Angeles County compared to Delaware. So we're talking about an LA County sized comet out there kind of flying at us. Um, yeah. So you know, keep that in mind whenever we reference Delaware, it's a little longer than that. <laughs> Um, so, Patrick, there's been some talk about the Hubble Space Telescope having troubles, the computers were down, um, they were trying to get it going again, and if we're going to get any images from Hubble about this comet, it needs to be back and fully capable. So, what's the, what's the story about Hubble? Are we okay? Well, actually, uh, yeah, it, it got into a little spot of trouble uh, last month. Um, in fact, on June 13th, uh, the computers... Um, uh, there was a computer problem on board Hubble, uh, which caused the telescope to go into a safe mode. And that uh, computer actually turned out to be the science computer. And the bad news, of course, when that computer goes down, all these instruments in these uh, red rectangles, uh, they can still collect data, but they can't be processed and sent through this uh, science computer. So there was a lot of um, engineering and a lot of technicians at work uh, trying to figure it out um you know there was computer memory issues uh, and uh, they kind of narrowed it down to um uh to a um uh, a power supply um anyway the the, the pro whole problem was that there was no science data uh, for a whole month uh, coming uh, transmitted down from hubble and uh after a, a lot of work uh, they did figure out um uh a way to turn on the uh, the backup computer on Hubble, uh, which has not been turned on since it was installed back in 2009, the last uh, shuttle uh, mission. Um, they had to turn on several boxes. It took all of 15 hours uh, to uh, switch from the main computer to the backup computer. And uh, that was uh, successful. And that occurred on uh, July 17th. And then two days later, these images came in beautiful images of uh, peculiar galaxies out there in space. So Hubble is back and is doing science for us again. Well, that is really, really good news. Um, and in fact, I'd like to point out that these images, the first ones that were taken, are part of Dr. Julianne Del Canton's program to capture disturbed galaxies, these ARP galaxies. Um, she is a wonderful astronomer, one of my favorite astronomers um, out there. She did the Hubble uh, project that covered Andromeda, which is one of my favorite galaxies. She was recently named the next director for the Center of Computational Astrophysics at the Flatiron Institute. So congratulations to her and her next position there. I can't wait to see what comes out of that. And I really want to get her on All Space Considered to come talk about these really cool interacting galaxies you're seeing here. Um, I'm sure we can get her. It's just a matter of getting into her schedule. She's a very busy woman and a wonderful astronomer. We're lucky to have her out there. Uh, now it's time for us to turn to Out to Launch tonight um chris <laughs> what has been going on out there are we uh <laughs> what hasn't been going on this has been an exciting time uh, yeah i've still got some ptsd from putting these stories together uh events have been occurring literally this week uh and in the last day literally things have happened so all kinds of stuff is going on uh let's have a whip around quick tour first of all uh, the Russians delivered a new module, a uh, laboratory module, to the International Space Station. Uh, it did, after some difficulties in Earth orbit uh, with its propulsion system, it did manage to sail up to the ISS and dock. Um, however, then we had a little bit of excitement with the Nauka module, as it is known. After being docked and latched to the station, it began firing without having been asked to do so, it's steering rockets. And with its steering rockets firing, of course, that's gonna push the whole space station around. Initially, they reported it might've been 45 degrees the station was moved, uh, but that's been appended. We now know it was 540 degrees, a complete 360 degree turn, and then proceeding to end up on its back upside down. Now, of course, there's no, you know, they're in weightless conditions up there, and the astronauts were never in any danger. The rotation was not fast enough for the crew to even feel it. But, of course, for the sake of the communications antennae and the uh, uh, solar power panels and everything else, they had to get the station back into position. Uh, with this uh, Nauka misbehaving, uh, fortunately, we had 
the Progress 78 Russian cargo ship, automated cargo ship, it had thrusters too, and it automatically fired its to slow the movement down, eventually correct and stop it. And then they got the station back to its proper orientation. Uh, for now, we don't know exactly what caused the difficulty, uh, but the thrusters on the Nauka have been shut down and apparently the station is fine, but that's the kind of week it's been with plenty of excitement uh, uh, in the uh, out to launch segment. Um, and speaking of that, you will remember, we talked about the Boeing Starliner. The Boeing Starliner, the alternative or other uh, compared to the SpaceX Dragon uh, spacecraft to carry human beings into orbit from the United States. Now, Boeing had that other flight, you may remember, um, gosh, 18 odd months ago, uh, where it wasn't able to reach the space station. Uh, they were able to get the vehicle back, but there were all kinds of software problems. Uh, NASA had a list of 80 corrections that had to be made to the vehicle, and they managed to get uh, a new launch attempt, a new spacecraft, everything ready. And it was supposed to launch actually uh, about the time that the Russian module arrived. Well, they postponed for one day, and then we're gonna give Starliner its try. But during the countdown, they found indications of propulsion valves in the wrong positions. They weren't sure if it was the instruments or the valves were really in the wrong positions, but they troubleshooted the problem for a while and they just weren't able to resolve it. So just as of the last day or two, the Starliner and its rocket have been rolled back to the hangar. They're gonna to have to disassemble things, get in there and see if they can find out what's going on. Um, now, does that mean that NASA uh, feels that uh, they bought a lemon? Uh, that, that, that's silly, but you got to understand uh, vehicles as complex as these, they do have teething troubles and problems. Uh, SpaceX had one of their prototypes blow up on the ground. Nobody in it, of course. Uh, the Apollo spacecraft had a fire that actually did kill three astronauts before it got to fly. Now, complex technical uh, programs like this do have difficulties. I hope that the Starliner's teething problems are resolved soon. It'd be wonderful to have it in flight. But the main thing is for all of you, uh, I'll get back to you on Starliner. We'll see when uh, when it may fly again. Um, there are There is other news uh, over in the SpaceX world. SpaceX got some good news. The Europa Clipper mission to investigate the ice-covered moon Europa around Jupiter, um, possibly with another water ocean under that ice. We think so. Um, Europa Clipper was for many years tied to the SLS, Space Launch System, that NASA was developing. It's a very expensive, very capable rocket. It's expensive, though. It had been behind in its schedule for a number of years. And NASA had asked if maybe they could use one of the commercial launch vehicles to launch it. But just now, in the last budget approved by Congress for 2021, they allowed NASA to choose if they wanted to use another vehicle. And they have chosen the three booster version of the Falcon rocket known as Falcon Heavy. The launch will occur in 2024 and the arrival at uh, Jupiter and Europa will occur in 2031. So that's upcoming. Now, as far as SpaceX, uh, those guys drive me crazy, absolutely crazy. I can't keep up with them. Uh, the site down in South Texas, where they are building that gigantic rocket, two-part rocket, we've seen tests of the upper stage, the Starship, which eventually they're hoping someday will carry people. But we haven't seen tests of the big rocket that goes underneath it, the booster. Here you see one of the first boosters. They rolled out a test article first to just see if everything fit. And they did a test firing of a couple of engines, but now they have finished the first one they mean to fly to orbit. They have put it out on the launch pad. And oh boy, is this thing, the, the booster by itself is 230 feet tall. And just in the last day, they have rolled out the spaceship part, the starship, the upper stage, they put it on top of the other stage, a full stack for the first time, and that stack broke every record for the largest rocket ever assembled in the world, taller than the Saturn V. And you want to talk about power. 
you <laughs> look at the business end of this thing. This is a picture of the bottom of the booster as they're finishing it up. In fact, let me show you a different angle on it. Um, the picture on the left is a real picture. There are 29 engines and they're not small engines. These are some of the most capable rocket engines ever made. And there's 29 of these beasts. It's and just Chris, incredible. Chris, those yeah. uh, engines of uh, uh, methane. And you know, I didn't, you, you're absolutely right, Patrick. I didn't think that this was another methane story. And that's important actually because of where they want to go. They can manufacture uh, methane on Mars. And so they chose uh, liquid oxygen and methane as a combination because of where they're going. They think they can fill her up on Mars. So it's actually very important uh, that it use that fuel. Uh, other vehicles that go to the moon, for example, they would use hydrogen and oxygen because they think they can get hydrogen and oxygen uh, from deposits on the moon. Uh, but yes, you're exactly right. It's another methane story and a happy one. And here's one happy thing. I just want to let you know this happened because we're all looking forward to the fall with the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. When it does go into space, perhaps in November now, um, it'll be riding on an Ariane 5 rocket. This is not that launch. It hasn't happened yet. This is the Ariane 5 just recently launching two communication satellites. The important thing about this and how it ties to the James Webb telescope is that there'd been a problem. Uh, they need to do some redesign work on the clamshell nose cone that separates to get out of the way so satellites can deploy in space. They redesigned it. This flight that you see right here was the test and the test worked fine which clears the Ariane 5 for what is arguably the most important payload it will ever carry in the fall. So yeah. that is the world of out to launch. I, gosh, I hope next month left, less is going on. Yeah, well, I, I doubt that. Uh, well, by then they'll have launched one of the starships. They'll it, 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 yeah. explode, something will happen. Um, I, I'm interested that that Boeing Starliner, one thing to keep yeah. in mind, Indeed, it's complicated. There's a lot of parts going on. SpaceX tended to have the philosophy of, well, if it blows up, we'll build another one. Yeah, Boeing rapid, is operating a little bit more under the lines of, we don't want it to go wrong, but their last test flight, like we reported on, wasn't perfect. And test flights aren't always perfect. This yeah. one, I think they want to have go a little bit better. So I don't blame them for pulling it back in. Um, this is why we test, you know, things do go wrong. and. You know That's they'll right. they'll get to the bottom of it. This is this is all part of it. Indeed, now, indeed. it is a wonderful time of year to get out there and view the skies. And Patrick is here to tell you all about your August sky report. Yeah. So um, if you've uh, been looking at this, looking at the sky, especially to the west in the evening, you notice a very brilliant star-like object, and that is the planet Venus, which has been prominent for a few months in our sky and uh, is visible um, uh, throughout this month. Uh, it is, uh, you can see it right after sunset and, and as the sky darkens, it's, it's unmistakably bright. So uh, definitely uh, something to look for. Now through a telescope, um, it looks like a, a kind of white gibbous phase uh, shape there. And that's it is exactly what it uh, looks like if uh, you can see it through a telescope. Uh, a few things happening uh, with Venus uh, on the 10th, uh, the um, uh, two and a half day old uh, crescent moon is uh, almost uh, parallel with uh, Venus. So we wanna go and take a look at that. Um, the next night, uh, the moon, actually I should mention, uh, harder to see is way down there near the horizon, the planet Mars, uh, which is lost in the twilight there. You need a pair of binoculars to see it. But the next night, the moon would have moved uh, up um, into the constellation of uh, Virgo the Maiden. In our evening sky in general, um, in August, uh, if you look to the south, the uh, constellations of Scorpius, the Scorpion, and uh, Sagittarius uh, uh, dominate the southern uh, part portion of our southern sky. And um, you can look for that. On the 15th, the first quarter moon is actually uh, near the head of the, uh, of the scorpion. It's the first quarter moon. Um, over in the uh, southeast, uh, 
There are two constellations which are much harder to see because they comprise of faint stars, but they belong to the, uh, the constellations of the zodiac, and those are Capricornus, the sea goat, and Quirus, the water bearer. But in these constellations are two bright planets, the brightest of which uh, is Jupiter, which we talked about earlier, and the uh, fainter one is the planet Saturn. Uh, these are, this is a great time to uh, go out and observe uh, these two planets. Uh, so here's a picture that was taken uh, just last month with, where you see uh, Jupiter and Saturn just rising in the uh, southeast. It was taken by our telescope demonstrator, uh, Anthony Perkett. Now, uh, these planets will get a visit by the moon. So on the 20th, uh, Saturn and the moon uh, will be close together. And then the next night, oh, there we go. Next night, uh, the moon will have moved uh, just below uh, Jupiter. And you don't really need a large telescope to see uh, both Jupiter and, uh, and Saturn. Here is a picture taken through an eight inch telescope by Anthony Perkett. And you can see Jupiter, it's cloud bands, uh, and it's uh, four uh, large Galilean moons. The moon Callisto is uh, just outside of this uh, image. And the same with Saturn. Saturn presents a beautiful view, uh, even through a small telescope, where you can even see its rings and maybe uh, one of its bright moons, uh, Titan. And you can certainly see them uh, when we're open um, here at the observatory, uh, when we have our lawn telescopes out at night on a clear night, and through our telescope on the roof as well. Now going to uh, one of the uh, most favorite meteor showers of the whole year, it's the Perseids. It uh, peaks on the night of the 11th, uh, through to the morning of the 12th. And uh, you can see between about 50 to about 80 meteors uh, per hour. The moon won't be a problem, it will set early. And so uh, if you are uh, going out uh, to observe the uh, meteor shower, uh, make sure you uh, go far from city lights and uh, observe uh, this shower. So the, uh, the peak of the peak is 3.40 to 4.40 a.m. if you wanna see the most meteors. And um, it is a really uh, treat, special treat. I've watched it from year to year and it never disappoints. Um, sometimes you can see brilliant uh, meteors called fireballs, which are brighter than the planets themselves, uh, streaking across the sky, leaving these beautiful green uh, iron, ionized uh, oxygen trails uh, for that last for maybe a few minutes. Uh, so it, this is a re very rewarding um, a meteor shower not to be missed. All right, so in the morning sky, uh, if you're up really early, like 4 a.m., um, Jupiter and Saturn have been up all night, but have moved uh, to, the, uh, to the west um, area of the sky. Um, there are some uh, constellations in the sky that you can uh, look for, um, and they're mostly constellations that you would see in the early autumn, autumn evening. One of them is Pegasus, and Pegasus is made out of uh, three stars uh, circled here, the main part of Pegasus, and a fourth star, which belongs to the constellation of Andromeda. Uh, these four stars, if you just draw a line between them, uh, make up the asterism known as the Great Square of Pegasus. Uh, so something to look for there. In the uh, Easter, um, you can see the, the constellation of Orion and uh, Taurus the Bull. Uh, winter constellations have just emerged from the glare of the sun. So if you're missing Orion, there they are. Get up early, look to the east. So our moon phases for this month. Uh, well, we have... Um, New moon on the 8th, uh, first quarter on the 15th, full moon on the 22nd, and last quarter on the, uh, on the 30th. And that's the sky report for this month. So enjoy looking at the sky, enjoy the meteor shower. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. And now it is time for some beautiful pictures, pretty pictures with Katie. And also she'll talk about space weather as she's been doing. So Katie, um, what do you have for us tonight? Um, first of all, I advanced, of course, onto these. I shouldn't have done that on you, but these are amazing. What, what's up with this? Yeah, so these first set of images are from telescope demonstrator Anthony Perkick. And while- Although, I think your audio is a little quiet. Let's make sure you, you're a little louder. 
Um, these images, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Um, Anthony Perkick, um, telescope demonstrator, when he was out observing in mid-July. So if you use a black light, you can actually um, take photos of scorpions like this, which are very cool in my opinion. Also from Anthony Perkick, this is the sunset from July 13th from Griffith Observatory. And here we have a beautiful image of the moon in the upper left and Venus right in the middle. The Zeiss Dome with the moon overhead and you can see Los Angeles downtown. And this is from David Pinsky, beautiful image of the moon from July 22nd. And this is also from David Pinsky, crescent moon on the right and Mars and Venus on the left there. Mars is the fainter of the two on the left. And a gorgeous sunset from David Pinsky. This one was from July 30th from Griffith Observatory. This is a NASA APOD image. Um, this is the ring galaxy. And one of my favorites, Neptune and Triton, another NASA APOD image. And some beautiful aurora. Um, this is from Space Weather, Joel Weatherly on July 28th from Canada and another beautiful image of the aurora. This one's called the edge of space. We know that space weather is what creates aurora on earth. So we'll move to our sun. This is our current sun today taken by David Pinsky. Hmm. And a live image on the sun on the left there. Uh, the coronal mass ejections, you can see a little bit of activity on the right and our sun on the right. So not too much happening today. We'll look at the aurora forecast. You can see bright green for the northern and southern hemisphere of Earth, northern on the left and southern on the right. So lower probability for today, but check the NOAA uh, space weather forecast for your daily aurora forecast. Well, thank you for that, Katie. One of these days, you're going to bring us an aurora forecast that says, drive out of LA, get out into the dark. You can see them. Okay, probably not. You probably have to go a little north, although there was a time I was in Reno and we were told to go out and go look for them. We, we saw nothing, but it, it was a fun evening to go try. Um, the only time I ever saw the aurora borealis was from the upper peninsula of Michigan, actually, the UP. So um, I'd love to go see him again sometime. Yeah. Well, we are finally on to our last segment tonight, and we are more or less on time. We knew we'd go a little bit long tonight because we're bringing you an additional segment about Apollo 15. Indeed, it has been 50 years since Apollo 15 went to the moon. We are celebrating the 50th anniversary. We've been celebrating most of the 50th anniversaries of the Apollo missions. Um, COVID threw us for a little loop that had to have us merge them into all space considered due to all sorts of stuff, but we are following through and tonight, Chris Butler is here to tell you about some of the amazing things that went on during the mission. And then afterwards, I will explain to you why it would have been really, really difficult to hoax. Um, some of you that have seen that before, I'll go through it quickly. And I have some new material, but um, it's always fun to tell people why it's harder to hoax going to the moon than just going. But Chris, what was Apollo 15 all about? And it looks like we brought a car with us this time. We did indeed. And uh, I think the number one takeaway for everybody is not just another moon mission. The last three, 15, 16, and 17, were a sudden jump up, a big jump. People who were alive at the time remember watching it, you know, this was a total transformation of what Apollo could do. And why is that? Why were we doing all these new exciting things? Well, I like to put it like this. Um, in my opinion, this is when Apollo grew up. 
the first few flights were just tests to see if the system worked. Of course, they gathered samples and they tried to do some science, but they were still refining and perfecting the vehicle. This is only Apollo 11, 12, 14, 13 didn't land, of course. This is only the fourth landing on the moon. So it's not surprising. They were still working on the vehicles, making uh, reductions in the amount of weight so that they could carry more. And here's one of the big payoffs, the lunar roving vehicle. We could carry it on 15. Earlier landers were just too heavy. They couldn't carry the payload and the vehicle was in development. But the main thing is we were refining Apollo. What does a rover do for you? Why is that a big deal? Think about it. The earlier astronauts on 11, 12, and 14, they had to walk. They had to walk everywhere they went. And that means you can't go very far and you can't go very fast. And the oxygen's running out in your backpack the whole time. Going fast helps in every possible way. It was a huge difference. And also, while we're at it, the uh, spacecraft in orbit, Endeavor is, was her name, uh, she's crammed now with science instruments that were put in a part of the service module that wasn't used. Why were they able to do that? Partly weight reductions in the vehicle opened up payload capacity so they could put huge tracking uh, cameras in there, uh, <laughs> spectrometers, magnetometers, all kinds of different things. And they even were able to pack in a sub-satellite, a sub-spacecraft. You can see it next to the command module there. It's the thing with the three antennae on it. They ejected that into orbit around the moon to conduct research into the moon's gravitational field. <laughs> and it wasn't just even the, the vehicles. The tools we were using on the moon had improved. Why? Well, the scientists had new ideas. That's part of it. But also the experience of the astronauts. This is the fourth landing. Astronauts had come back and said what they needed, what worked best, what they should try. And the rake that you see on the left, for example, that was partly devised by the astronauts working with the geologists for how to grab lots of pebble-sized samples quickly. You just run the rake through, it strains them out and a good development. And on the other side, you've got Dave Scott. That's an actual picture from Apollo 15. And he's carrying a camera, but if you look, it looks a, a longer than usual. The reason for that, Dave got the idea, we need a telephoto lens, a big one, a 500 millimeter telephoto lens. That's like a small telescope. What was he doing with that out on the lunar surface? He was taking detailed pictures of things they couldn't get to, there wasn't time for, that were farther away, or like the tops of mountains where they couldn't get to it. So lots of improvements in that as well. Now that Apollo's grown up, where do they want to go? Now that we can go more places, which Apollo now could do, uh, it could reach higher latitudes north and south than it had before, the scientists rolled out their list of, all right, you're done practicing, now we're going for the most important sites on the moon. One of the ideas was craters. That was a big idea. Why? Craters are like a drill hole. It digs material up from deep inside the moon and brings it up. Now, Tycho Crater, early favorite, talked about throughout Apollo, but the floor was too rough. Siakovsky Crater had a flat floor, but unfortunately it was on the backside of the moon. And without a relay satellite, we wouldn't be able to talk to the astronauts. And NASA was nervous about depending on the relay. So Tsiolkovsky was out. Alphonsus Rill and Alphonsus Crater was an example of one of dozens, dozens of places that were proposed. But for Apollo 15, the first one with the lunar rover, the big step up, it came down to two candidates. One of them shown on the left is Marius Hills. Marius Hills is flatter. It's safer to land. Now, the things that look like little pimples there, they're actually, of course, big. Um, they, those are several hundred feet high. Those are dome volcanoes. We still believe today they're some of the last volcanic features that formed on the moon. And looking for volcanic features is something they wanted to do. But the main attraction is it's a lot safer to land there. The other site, the one Hadley Apennine on your right, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see how much more difficult it would be to land there. The terrain is much rougher. Those bumpy looking things next to the X, X marks the landing spot, um, 
those aren't little bumps. Those are mountains 15,000 feet tall. It's incredible the thought of flying over those and then come through a landing. If you look next to the X on the other side, you'll see a little winding snake-like depression. That's a real as well, a volcanic feature. And it's a thousand feet deep. So between mountains and the rill, you have to do a precision landing there. The astronauts in the end made the decision this site was so important, they would have to go there. And so Hadley Appenine was chosen. Now, remember I said that craters would dig things up. Absolutely. Tycho would have dug up some things, Copernicus, Sierkowski, any of them. But if you look at the moon tonight yourself or on a full moon night, You'll see the big circular patch marked on the left there. That's Mar Imbrium, the Sea of Rains. It's circular in outline for a good reason. It is the remains of a gigantic super crater. We call them an impact basin that formed on the moon very early in its history. And our landing site is right on the edge. Those mountain ranges are actually the rim of the crater. So what could they find there? Maybe the oldest rocks on the moon, maybe the original rocks. Hadley was a big, big deal. So the scientists trained the astronauts more than they ever had before. Um, they, they had them just absolutely fall in love with uh, field geology. There we go. Oh, go back. Uh, I want to show one guy from Caltech, a shout out for our friends at Caltech. Uh, in the black and white photograph, the gentleman wearing the hat is Dr. Leon Silver of Caltech's geology department, taking the astronauts out and helping them fall in love with field geology. Uh, how did it go? Well, it went very well. This is no Apollo 13. We were able to do what we wanted to do. There's a picture of Jim Irwin standing on the moon with uh, Mount Hadley Delta behind him again, like 13,000 feet tall, the lunar module Falcon, and you can see the lunar rover. Did it work? Yes, actually the lunar rover worked quite well. There were a few little hiccups, but it was able to transport them all the way out to the rill, not just to the rill, but even over the rim where we found some of the only lunar bedrock, not a rock that was blasted out by a crater, but that cooled off right where they found it in its original spot. That's one of the few times we've ever seen that on the moon. And we also found the very famous, you probably heard of it, Genesis rock. They think they did find a piece of the moon's original first crust when it first cooled off. Incredible find, but that was what we expected from Hadley. We also all got to enjoy it because there was a television camera on the rover, both astron uh, the uh, public and the scientists could follow along with the explorations of the astronauts. So it felt like we were all along for the trip. And while we're at it, they did some unusual and fun things we usually did when we went to the moon. In this case, you see this envelope has uh, stamps on it. It also has a little smudgy gray stuff, which I will tell you is moon dust. And the stamps, they're a little hard to read, but they actually say that this stamp was canceled on the moon. This is the only time you've ever had a letter mailed from the moon. And then lastly, just uh, wrapping it all up, what did it do? 170 pounds of samples. Apollo 14 brought back 93. And among those 170 pounds were possibly a piece of the moon's original crust. The results were incredible. The scientists were delighted. The astronauts performed much more complex, brand new, improved science experiments when they were on the surface and in orbit as well. And they also paved the way for Apollo 16 and 17 by proving that the new, improved kind of super Apollo would really work. So we owe Dave and Jim and Al there uh, a huge vote of thanks. They cast a uh, legacy that will last far, far, far into the future. It looked like science fiction, but it did really happen. <laughs> I'm going to say it really happened. But I don't, now, Dr. Reitzel, you're going to – you going to shoot this down, say it didn't happen? Well, maybe, maybe. Um, I've, I've got some ideas. Okay. You know, set up a soundstage, have Doge come direct it, put some wires on an astronaut, bounce them around, look like it's low gravity. Right. You know, it's, it's stick a few light sources on there to create the shadows and you got yourself a, a nice movie 
It's, it's easy to do just like that. Well, to do it, what do you really have to do? Well, they made a bunch of hardware, of course. Engineers worked on all that hardware. We built the largest rocket ever that was only today. Literally today is the first day that a larger rocket was stacked than yep, the one yep. they built and showed off to people. Here, they here. built capsules that were capable of carrying people in them. This engineer here, he's, you know, he knew this thing would be, the people in there would be safe. He helped them into the capsule. He believed it all, or, or somebody would pay him off and he would say it didn't happen. More engineers working on the lander. And indeed you can see our, our little friend, the rover hanging out right here, being loaded yep. onto it. Um, but they built all this hardware and they believed it would work. They tested it on the ground. So the, basically you've built everything that could get you to the moon. All these people really thought it would happen. All the readouts on all these displays, all the printouts all had to be faked to show we were sending people to the moon because all these engineers expected to see the readings that would tell them they were on the way to the moon um, or they're all in on it. And do you think they all kept their mouth shut? I doubt it. Uh, nobody can keep a secret these days. Um, we launched these things. People saw them go up. It wasn't, you know, the, the, the Soviet Union, I'm sure, had spies on hand on the Florida coast watching these things go up. We, okay. They could fly in. There was no issue. Just get on a plane. They'd fly in and watch it. Um, People observed things happening in space that were consistent with what we expected to happen from those rockets. Things like separations, second stage ignitions, all that sort of stuff was observed from the ground. Um, the panels of the service module blowing off, where there were four of them, you'd expect in this artist's conception to look a little like that. Well, here's the actual picture of it from the ground. Those trails, by the way, are star trails. You have to track wow. the spacecraft on its way to the moon so yeah. if it's not going to the moon you won't get this picture right so even this you know can't fake it the soviet union like i said they had a large interest in making people know we were faking it and they had very large ships with big radio dishes and in order to pick up a signal you have to point it at the spacecraft as it's going to the moon so we had to fake signals from a spacecraft on the way to the moon that was responding to questions being sent from the ground sounding like live transmissions. So now you're faking television programs and radio programs coming from a spacecraft that's on its way to the moon. And it has to be doing that because the Soviet Union would have said, it's not coming from there. So literally if it were faked, we still had to somehow can all of this, put it all on a, on a tape drive and send it on a robotic craft. I mean, it's starting to get really hard to make all this work. Not only that, we had huge warehouses with immense amounts of gray dirt that we had to have these you know, paint these huge scenes, truck it all in. Um, it's okay, it's not all gray, actually. I'm seeing some red dirt, some kind of almost black dirt. There's different colors. So they just didn't get one source. They just didn't fake it. You look at those backgrounds of old Star Trek episodes, and I love the Star Trek series, so don't get me wrong, but you can tell that it's a studio a lot of the time, you know? Um, well, unless they were out at uh, the Vasquez Rocks, of course, the Gorn was actually there near LA at a site that's great. Um, you can see here, you know, they drove the car around getting different perspectives of those mountains in the background. So not only did they have to paint these huge mat, mat paintings to do the back warehouse walls, they had to have different ones that changed perspective as they drove the car around to make it look like they were going large distances in this vehicle. So where are all those mat paintings? What did they do with them all? Who's the guy that painted them? Who's, where's the woman that sat there and painted all this stuff? Those people want recognition. I don't think they're being quiet. Now you're gonna say, where are the stars? These, this is all fake, there are no stars here at all. Well, here's a picture we took of the front of Griffith Observatory with a camera. I don't see any stars. All right, you say, well, clearly you didn't expose long enough, it's silly. Okay, we'll expose a little longer. Picture's a little better, still not a great picture of Griffith Observatory. So we exposed a little bit longer. And now indeed we have a pretty good picture of the front, but it's starting to get overexposed. Those lights are a little too bright, but we are seeing clouds. And now if we go a little bit more, a longer exposure, you can see our beautiful cupola up there. You can see the dome of the Samuel Ocean Planetarium in the background and the clouds are quite nice. There's even what looks like a couple of spots from probably um, movie premieres or something in the sky up there, but we've lost all the detail here in the front of the building. It's completely what's called overexposed. So you can't, even with a modern camera today, and I think we took this in 2014 probably, um, or maybe 2016. Anyway, modern cameras today, relatively modern, can't get very bright things and very faint things at the same time. Do you think back in the late 60s, early 70s, when we went to the moon, we would expose long enough to get the stars and still be able to see the moon and the earth? No, 
you go to the moon to get this picture. You don't go to take pictures of stars. It would ruin the foreground picture. Now you might say, well, shadows are going the wrong direction. What about that? It shows they're using spotlights and everything's wrong. Well, here's a shadow going this direction. Here's a shadow going this direction. Okay, so maybe there's a light source off that direction and another light source off this direction. Still confuses me because you should have multiple shadows, but maybe some magic is going on here that's making the multiple shadows not happen. But I was on my walk up to Griffith Observatory the other day, um, well, the other year at this point, these shadows aren't going the same direction. This is just a couple of poles on the walk up. Um, this is called perspective. We figured this out in the Renaissance when we were painting things. Also, again, <laughs> Um, the shadows, yeah, the shadows <laughs> go in different directions. Some of this is the fact the land has different relief, different elevations. Some of it is just perspective, the way that it works when you're imaging things. So if you know how reality works, the shadows on the moon are not a problem at all. We've left instruments that bounce radiation back directly where it comes. Think bike reflector. You know what it all is like. You have a bike. You see the bright. It looks like the lights are shining, but it's really coming from your own car headlights. Well, we left those on the moon to bounce lasers off the moon to see how far away the moon was. It lets you measure the distance. Well, if you point to the right spot, you get a reflection. If you don't point to the right spot, you don't. You have to point where we left them and we left them at the Apollo landing sites. We also brought back a lot of rocks, like Chris was saying. In fact, this is the rock that was brought back, Apollo 14, I believe, that our big Bertha sample is from um, at Griffith Observatory. We own a chunk of one of those rocks you're looking at. Well, we don't own it, we have it on display. It is leased to us from Griffith Observatory, or from, from NASA. Um, and my cat's causing trouble now here, so let me fix a couple of things. Um, anyway, that what's interesting about them is all these rocks, if they're exposed to the surface, show these little micro, meteorite impacts, little tiny, tiny craters. You don't get those on Earth because our atmosphere burns up the little grains of sand as meteors. The Perseid meteor shower leaves little tiny impact craters on the moon. On Earth, it burns up and gives us a beautiful meteor shower. So evidence, these rocks came from the moon. Now you might want to say, show me pictures. Some folks wanted to know. In fact, our question of the night from our foundation from Lisa Torres was, when we send the first woman to the moon with the Artemis program, are we going to be able to see her from Griffith Observatory with our telescopes? Well, unfortunately, no. You need a telescope something like a mile wide in order to get that sort of detail. And you'd likely have to have it in space because the atmosphere blurs things so much, you can't see that sort of detail. In fact, we had to send a spacecraft called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has about a 12 inch telescope on it. So about the size as our Zeiss telescope on the roof of Griffith Observatory, we sent it into orbit and it's a fairly low orbit and it's getting these sorts of pictures from the landing sites. You can see that the land is disturbed. You can see some of the stuff we left behind. In fact, here's a zoom in of the Apollo 17 landing. Actually, you can see the descent stage. You can see, um, the Challenger descent stage, the all set equipment, again, that's the science equipment that's left there, geophone rock, they've named a rock that. And on top of it, all those little tracks that are doubles, those are car tracks left by the, again, the rover that was there, they took with it on 15, 16, and 17. So we can't see an individual person that might look like a little dot bouncing around from a telescope like MRO in orbit, but it's a great question from our foundation. And I encourage all of you that wanna have one of your questions appear at All Space Considered, join the foundation. It's a great way to get involved. We have special events. You too can participate with Griffith Observatory. Anyway, lastly, Apollo 15 ran a science experiment on the moon and they got footage of it. The footage isn't great. Remember, this is a television camera, an old school television camera, the low res stuff that, well, I remember it. A lot of you younger folks don't know what low res television was like, but go to Hulu or something and put on an old show that was from the 50s and it'll look a little blurry in your modern 2021 TV. But take a look at this. I'm just going to let it run. And this is an experiment and it's all very well explained. So enjoy this look. Uh, Tim, we copied a both solar wind and uh penetrometer drum in the ETB. Not quite yet. I haven't put the solar wind in yet, but I will shortly. I want to watch this. Okay. A, a good picture there. Be I've got the... Beautiful picture, Dave. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, 
findings and on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Which proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. So, uh, Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Now notice, that shows a few things. A hammer and a feather fell at the same rate. Now you might think, okay, what's the big deal? Well, go drop a hammer and a feather here on Earth. Can't do it here. Right the hammer's gonna, you know, just fall down and hit your foot probably. Well, if you're me, it might. Um, so that showed there was no atmosphere. You're testing it without the atmosphere. The two fall at the same rate and hit. Now on top of it, they still fell more slowly than they should. So either they slowed down that footage in a room that had all the air pumped out of it. That's how you had to fake that. You had to have a room big enough for them to jump around in and move. And now there had to be wires on him too, because they're all kind of moving slowly and funny. And then they had a hammer and a feather and they drop them. And if there were air in the room, the feather would have fluttered and there was no fluttering, it just fell. Or maybe they made a magic feather out of lead, but the feather kind of flopped around when he moved it. So there's, it had to be a, anyway, the whole thing makes no sense to do it here on earth. That really shows it was on the moon. Um, it's hard to fake this stuff. It's just hard to fake it. You can't get the physics right. Um, the dirt that's kicked up when the astronauts bounce around, it yeah. poofs up into the air, falls unusually slow and is gone. There's no dust cloud left. That doesn't happen where you have atmosphere. So all this footage we're seeing has to happen without any atmosphere. And we couldn't make giant pumped out, you know, vacuums the size of stages. It can't be done. You can only make them so big. So anyway, you can't fake this stuff. But a lot of folks say, well, then why didn't we go back? You know, why, you had to have faked it. Otherwise, you would have gone back. Well, first of all, we did go back. Apollo 11, 12. We faked one that we we failed. Why would we do that as a nation? Let's fake a failure. Oh, to make it more realistic. Sure. 14, 15, 16, 17. So we did go back. We went back six times successfully and one time in a failure. Now, on top of it, look at the budget as a percentage of the federal budget. So it does change. This isn't raw numbers at all. But you can see it was a big, important thing for us to do in the, the mid-60s. As soon as the hardware was built, the funding started to dry up immediately. And by the time we're actually going late 60s, early 70s, you know, it's about half of what it was when it was at its peak. And then you drop into the 70s and 80s and you're down under 1% of the federal budget. It's right now about half a penny for every dollar you send in, in your taxes goes to NASA. Yeah. So folks that wanna say the space program's too expensive and we should be cutting things this is not where we're wasting money, folks. NASA is pretty cheap in the long run. And you notice all the stuff we did. Well, we did um, Apollo Soyuz. We did that. We had the space station. We had, um, well, the early Skylab space station. We ran the shuttle. We built the International Space Station. We launched the Hubble Space Telescope, a bunch of other stuff, all with this budget. So if you want to go to the moon, which we are doing now with very small amounts of money with Artemis, um, which is why it's going rather slowly, um, it takes money to do it. It just does. And it takes dedication. And I believe we have the will to go back now. I really do. I think we're going to get back there. I think the hardware is being built. I think um, SpaceX and Elon Musk and his team with their rapid development, we are in for some really exciting times. So I do think we went to the moon. I think we did. I think we left boot prints. I think we left tire tracks. I think we brought back a whole lot of samples. You can't explain otherwise. So that is our show tonight, folks. We are super happy to have, have had all of you join us here tonight. And we will be back next month on Friday, September 3rd, 2021 for our next show. And by the way, the observatory currently is open on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You must wear a mask. There is public transportation to get there. But as always, check our website for details. Conditions could change. We have to follow the rules and regulations as we are told by the city and conditions could change. Um, so we will update our webpage and that's the best thing to do if you wanna come visit is check the webpage and make sure we're open. Again, Griffith Observatory, um, would like to thank you all for joining us. I'd like to thank our whole team. I'd like to thank Patrick So, Chris Butler, um, Katie Flynn, Jeff McKibben for presenting tonight, our whole team of producers, Matthew, um, wonderful work as always in the, the booth switching things. 
And um, thank you all. Uh, thanks to the city of LA, who owns and operates Griffith Observatory, the Department of Recreation and Parks, and of course, the Griffith Observatory Foundation, which is our nonprofit partner. Thank you so much, folks, and we'll see you next month. Okay.